Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode. Uh, I'm very, very honored to have this gentleman here with us today. Legend in the strongman community, um, somebody that I've been following for quite some time now. Uh, we have the American monster, Robert Oberst. How you doing today, sir? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Dude, thank you for doing this, man. You're super busy, uh, as I could see, which is a great thing. That's a, obviously a great sign, um, especially in the fitness industry, man. It's hard to stay busy. Uh, but yeah, I, we'll get into all that. But first and foremost, man, I want to talk about like your early life because I know a little bit about your upbringing, um, but there's a lot of people that uh, support uh, just me in general who follow a lot of like the strongman obviously the top guys and everything, but you had pretty like a rough upbringing. Is that correct? Uh, I think rough is a relative term, you know, yeah, um, sure. when I look back at it, I don't consider it rough. I think a lot of other people do, but uh, you know, like I was always in a family, like my, my mom loved me very much, you know, and that's the kind of thing that, if you don't have that, that's real rough. And right. we didn't have money. We didn't have a lot of things, but like I had that. And that's, and when you have that, like the possibilities are endless. You can do anything. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I lived, uh, bounced around house to house, project housing, um, 10 kids in a three bedroom house with yeah. no electricity, uh, you know, shit like that. But like, you know, even as a kid, it doesn't feel rough. You know, you you and your brothers and sisters go play outside and shit like that. And am I allowed to cuss on this? Oh yeah, we're good. <laughs> YouTube. So, yeah, like when when you and your brothers are messing around outside and, and all that stuff, and th that doesn't connect the dots, right? Like I'd say, to me, the roughest part of my life was when I started fucking around when I got older. You know, like I was, I had a I had a situation um, when when I was a a teenager in my in my mid to late teens i was homeless and it, it it um it got worse and worse progressively because i kept making stupid decisions i needed i needed to grow and i needed to learn what i really valued and at, at the time i just hadn't gotten that lesson you know and so I think uh, childhood, yeah, we didn't have electricity. And a lot of people are like, oh, shit, you didn't have electricity. But as a kid, like, like it didn't it didn't mean that much. Like, we didn't realize, you know, like, I felt weird. Like, I'd go to church in dirty clothes and stuff, and it made me feel weird. But that was really, like, the only thing, uh, you know. Like, I felt like the rough part was was after when I should when I should have been fixing all that stuff, that's that. that got rough you know i was being silly and it took me a long time to actually figure out what i wanted to do and how to do it and to just grow up you know it took me a long time to grow up and then uh, luckily that you know I've, I've been given chance after chance and when i finally did grow up uh, there was opportunities there and i i ran through them like like my life depended on it right uh, so I guess, yeah, like in the moment when you're like living through that as a child, you don't really know how bad it is. And like you said, tough is like relative to whoever's going through it and everything. But yeah, I guess like when you're in the moment, man, you don't really know what you don't have until you have it. Right. Right. So then when exactly. you look back on it, it's kind of like then you compare and contrast. There's this feeling when you don't have money and it's like. It's like almost a desperation. It's this hole in your stomach, right? Like when you do get to eat, you eat past when you should stop. You'll eat till yep. you're sick, then you'll keep going. And and when you when you get money, you don't know how to hold it because like you never had it. And there's this this desperation that you feel in inside you. And I kind of I didn't even notice I had that. I just thought that was what living was. And then I, I got to a point where I didn't have to worry about rent, which was like the biggest thing. And a lot of people out there, that's still a thing. Like every month it's like, man, we got to make sure that, that we don't go out to eat because we got to pay the rent on the first. And once I finally moved past that, which isn't even like most people, that's not their goal. Most people's goal isn't not to worry about rent. It's to be able to to afford a nice vacation and and to have a nice house and all these different things. 
But once I moved past, like I can survive, like that that pit went away, and and then I realized I was living with that for a long time. So I guess depending on what you think, like that 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 could be considered rough. But like I spent time in Africa, and and I'm I'm around these kids that are fucking literally starving to death in Botswana, which is the capital, the highest percentage of people who have HIV and AIDS. And these kids have no prospects. They've got nothing. And they come up to me with these big smiles and they're just so full of love. Those kids got it rough. And even they don't know it. Like, like they know it better than I did because like, there's no prospect. There's no idea that they can grow, but that's what rough is, man. That shit. Like I, I had nowhere near any of that kind of shit. But even to those kids, right? Let's say like, because there's multiple stories. Like even Akon, the uh, the hip hop artist. Even those kids, if they grow up and find success, like in another country, they'll even look back on it, like how you look back on it, and may think, "Oh, that wasn't even rough," because it's all perspective, you know? Right. But and once you come out the other end of it, it's hard to look back at it with a negative attitude. If you get to come out the other end, it's hard to look back. And be like, oh, that that sucked. That was rough because that that makes you who you are, man. Like, I appreciate things so much. I love my son so much, and I'm so close with my family now, and and I'm so grateful for the opportunities I had. That like, it almost seems like a slap to my own face to look back and be like, oh yeah, I I had yeah. it rough, you know. Like, yeah, it's, man. It, it it was uh it was a necessary thing especially for someone like me man it took me a long time to mature and grow up i'm still i'm not mature at all yeah. but <laughs> but like at least at least i understand what's important in life now you know yeah man um i want to talk about like just i want to dive into strong man but not too rough like when did you like start going to the gym was it like at a young age or like working out or fitness like when did you get into all of that just working out because i assume you didn't just jump straight into strongman did you mm -hmm. so, so yeah when did you start like exercising all that so growing up my family didn't i i didn't have rules like i didn't have like curfew i didn't have like you gotta go to school and go, do your homework and all that shit my family didn't care about it. and um i wasn't even gonna go to high school and um, a friend of mine was on the football team and he hit me up and he's like, man, you, you got to come play ball. You got to. And so I was like, OK, I guess I'll go to high school, you know. And um, day one, I, I was like the biggest dude. I was I was manhandling people and I was but I was always a dork. I was awkward. I was, uh, you know, like you you develop weirdly when you're separate. You know, and um, so my solace was being in the gym. Like I felt comfortable there. Like I'd spend my lunch break in the gym. I, I'd hang out there. Like, uh, like uh, I made sure I had two PE classes like every semester. You know? And um, it, it was just my thing. And, and and I wasn't even trying to be the strongest. I wasn't none of that. I wanted to be a better football player, and that was it. And, you know when. When I got older and, and football was done with me, a friend of mine that I, I was a bouncer and a friend of mine was just obsessed with strong men, like literally, literally obsessed. Like he would he would get a lap dance from a stripper and talk to her about strong men. That kind of that <laughs> it's fucking insanity. And so uh, he had been begging me. He, he and I played junior college ball together. He'd been begging me. He's like, bro, you got to come try this. You got to try it. So. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how old I was. I was in my mid twenties somewhere and he convinced me to go in and uh, day one, I, I, I looked up what the amateur record for log press was yep. and I broke it by 40 pounds on day Damn. one. Damn. And I remember, I remember putting it down. It was like, I, I had, I had trained upper body exactly the way you would want to, to build a core like strength that's stable and firm and and i was just in that that mode still like i i was crushing reps at 225 and my shoulders were dense as fuck you know and so um yeah i remember hitting it and he he's been he'd been trying to get his pro card forever he still hadn't got it and uh i hit the log i put it down i was like so is that all right and he goes fuck you <laughs> <laughs> So from there, you just like saw this, you were good to go from there. 
I, I had to, I, I went home, Googled the sport right then because I'd never seen it. Googled it, and I was like, I can do this shit. I can do it. And I'm, everyone kept telling me, like, it's a waste. It's a waste. There's no money in it. It's fucking waste. And I was like, yeah, I understand that, that most of these guys don't know how to make money with it, but I do. Like, I know fucking take a platform and run with it. And I, I, I believed in myself because my mom, she'd always beat it into me. Like, you can do whatever the hell you want. Like, you can, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't like, you got to go to school, but she was definitely like, you can achieve anything. And so I had this weird confidence my whole life that was misplaced at a lot of times, you know, like I didn't deserve that confidence. And so like, I, I just jumped in the sport head first and I just knew I'd fucking do it. I think it was uh, six, seven months later, I was at my first Giants Live. And then on the flight home, I got my invite to World's Strongest Man. Damn, and that was so quick. First year was the only rookie in the finals. And that was that top 10. Damn, man. Dude, I remember when I was so I grew up watching uh, like the World's Strongest Man on ESPN and stuff, but I didn't really like pay no mind to it. It's just like these big ass dudes just lifting heavy shit. Right. It wasn't until. I bought a house out here in Davenport, Florida, which is about south, about 15 minutes south of Orlando. Um, and there was a strongman gym around 2015. There was an Anytime Fitness, which was the closest gym, and then this gym downstairs called Iron House. And the yeah, owner of it is uh, Alan, Alan Collins. Alan, Alan's place. Yeah. Yep. So dude, he is I, the, probably the greatest yoker of all time. Dude, so if you just had a yoke walk, he would, there would nobody ever that could beat him. I'm not getting. Brian Shaw, Big Z, anybody couldn't be Allen in a fucking yoke. I'm clipping this because he's going to love it. I was telling him that I'm speaking to you. Uh, but yeah, dude, so I would see. But he worked at the Anytime Fitness upstairs, so it was like half and half, right? So I remember one day I was at Anytime Fitness, and I'm a big WWE fan too, right? And I see Allen in the office, and here's this big-ass dude right in front of him. It turned out to be Adam Sher. Adam Sher. Yeah, Mom. a.k.a. Braun Strowman. So, dude... I would always see the strongman gym, all these guys downstairs lifting these heavy ass stones, throwing it over a bar. And I do more so like powerlifting slash bodybuilding, just more like volume wise weight or exercising. So I would always like be in tune. And then like, dude, going down there one strongman Saturday and just feeling the the brotherhood and like sisterhood and like the camaraderie. It's almost like the dudes. It's almost as important to everybody else for you to get that lift as it is to you, you know. So it's like yeah. strongman just changed for me from there and like i've always been interested in it hence why i started following you brian shaw thor all these guys it was because of alan collie man that, that the thing is is people on the outside think like that's that's the way almost all gyms are almost all gyms are that way and almost every amateur competition is that way where it's like they actually want you to do great even though they're competing with you but people make this mistake and pros fucking play this game all the time. I hate it where they pretend that it's like that in the pros and it's fucking not. It is so not. Yeah. Guys, guys are fine if you do good and they beat you. But if, if, if a guy's struggling or whatever, he's not trying to fucking cheer for you. It's so stupid. <laughs> I, I hate it. It's like, Oh, we're not even competing against each other. It's so fucking dumb. Like, and, and, I, there are a few guys out there, like Brian Shaw, for example. Brian Shaw really wants you to do your best and to beat you. That That is a 100% fucking fact. That's Brian. Me, I hope you break your fucking leg on the way to the game. <laughs> I get to walk in and take the trophy. I don't give a fuck how you do. I don't. I want my check. Like, I don't give a fuck. But, yes, I have friends in the sport. I like when they're doing well, all that kind of stuff. But even my friends, I don't want them to get hurt. I don't want anyone to get hurt, really. Right. But my friends, I'm not even cheering for you, bro. Like, I don't <laughs> want you to beat me. I don't. Like, it's, there's a, uh, it's weird. Cause like, it's like one of the only sports where the pros are still pretending that we want other people to, to do their best. And it's, it's super rare. There's not many guys who actually feel that way. It yeah. drives me fucking nuts. I think you mentioned, didn't you mention that when you were on Joe Rogan about like how you have to stay quiet? Yeah, I think you mentioned that before. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. I like to say that because 
it's it's so common for people to be like, you know, oh, look at them cheer. I've done it. I did it. Um, well, there's this really, really popular video where Giants Live, and it's me against Nick Best. Nick Best is one of my dear friends. I love Nick Best. And we're doing the stones. And we get done, and I beat him. I beat him clean, like, by, like, 25 seconds. And then I go over, and I'm screaming for him to get it up. And everyone's like, oh, da, 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 da. Immediately afterwards, I was like, you know, I only did that for the fucking video, right? <laughs> I told him. I told him. And he's like, I know, buddy. You know, like, I, I, I do want him to do well after I beat him. After I beat him, that's fine. But the, the pretending that we want someone else to do well and it doesn't matter if I beat him or not, shit, I fucking hate it. This is a competitive-ass sport. Dudes are giving way more than just their time for this sport. You're sacrificing your back. You're sacrificing your health. It's We all know that we're going to pay the, the piper for this. You know, like there's bills to be paid with this shit. And and to pretend that that we wouldn't rather win, it's it's almost disrespectful to the sport in itself. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second because you know I think you mentioned before in previous interviews how dangerous the deadlift actually is, like the risk and reward ratio uh-huh. compared to it. Um, yeah. There's an there's another guy, and I hope he doesn't watch this man because this is I'm not really like trying to throw a knock at him, but there's another guy that goes to Iron House by the name of Dimitar. You probably know uh, who I'm talking about. There's a I big do. meme of him with the stone i know he is. but he's just like he almost looks like he can't even like aid himself sometimes because these dudes are getting so big and big and it's just like damn bro like what is what is going to be the long lasting effects like years right. down the line hence why you're probably retiring after next year correct right definitely also i'm making more money doing other shit but yeah exactly um, the, but yeah, let's talk about like the long term health and all of that, like the deadlift, for example. Like, well, to me, a, a lot of that stuff got misconstrued. Like, really? you get what I said without really watching what I said. Like, most people read a highlight and were like, "Oh, Robert doesn't like the deadlift." It's true. I don't personally like it, but that's I played football forever, and we grew up. I didn't deadlift until like. The week that I tried that that log press was the first week I did heavy deadlifts. That was way after football and everything. We did power cleans and all that. And what I was saying was no other sports where there's big money, like professional baseball, professional basketball, professional football, professional soccer, none of them deadlift heavy. None of them. Not, most of them don't even touch a straight bar deadlift. I, I, I've spoken to ton of pro bowlers football players not one of them is deadlifted in the pros except for one my my good friend andy levitri who's a three-time pro bowler highest paid offensive guard to ever play the fucking game dude knows what he's talking about in atlanta one time they had a, a strength coach come in and he did deadlifts with them for two weeks and then he never did them again never but it, i don't know it was like he got told not to. I don't know the situation about what had happened. But in his long and great career, he deadlifted twice and 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 didn't like that they were doing it. Now, that being said, a proper deadlift, if someone's educated and has good form, it is very beneficial. It's a, it's it's strong and it's good for certain things, you know, your back and hands and, and posture. There's a lot of stuff that can be good for it. But the risk reward ratio to, to anybody who's paying attention is not really worth it. Like you can simply go side on bar, like a side on deadlift, and you take away almost all the risk. It's it's also not an athletic movement, which is why athletes don't do it. Now, if you want to be a big deadlifter and you love deadlift, and a lot of people do, fucking go for it. I don't give two fucks what you do in the gym. I really don't. I don't give a fuck. I, I was I have an issue. I, I go to a lot of schools and I talk to high school kids that play sports, mostly football athletes, and I see a lot of these fucking coaches who are like, you know, living their glory days through these kids, and they got them fucking max deadlifting in the week that they got a game. And it it drives me up the wall. Like you're risking this kid for no fucking reason. And it's all for your own ego. And that really upsets me. You know, I, I, I'm really against that. 
And I think that if we uh, if we separated ourselves from from what we were programming specifically for children, like I say children, I'm talking about high school age and younger. But if you take yourself out of it, there's there's really not a, a point to it. Yeah, I mean, you, you can also simply elevate the deadlift just a little bit and then takes away a big percentage of the risk as well. It's not an athletic movement. Now, yes, I, I do it. I fucking training to do it. I, I do it all the fucking time because it's part of my job. And there are a lot of people out there who are amazing athletes that love the deadlift. That's not to, not to negate those people. There's people who can do it properly. There's people who do it improperly and are somehow haven't hurt themselves, even though they've done it forever. But for the most, for the most part, like if you were to take a big fucking like global spectrum and see all the people, I'm not talking about your professional weightlifters and all those. I'm talking about your 24 hour fitness guys, your guys that go to gold's gym, all those guys who are bro lifting they hurt themselves on the deadlift almost as much as they hurt themselves on the bench, which is a big fucking statement. That's a big. Dude, I just deadlifted today and my lower back is sore. It gets sore every time I deadlift. And it's just like, I'm not even throwing any up anywhere near the weight that you guys throw. But it's like the even bodybuilders, like the most, the closest they get to deadlifts, like heavy deadlifts is probably just rack pulls. Right. It's like. It's really just, I, I think it's more of an ego lift. Like I'll, I'll go into the gym just to ego lift, honestly. Like I'll admit it. And it sucks because the deadlift really puts a lot of strain on my back specifically. I even tried switching to sumo, but people say sumos don't count. Um, the same people that don't give a fuck if you hurt yourself, bro. Like I'm not saying this because I get love for it. I get so much fucking hate for it. I, I care. Like I'm saying it because I've had, so many athletes, specifically football players, reach out to me and be like, thank you so much for saying this. I've been hurting so much and I keep trying to deadlift on top of it. The first time I went to the Giants Live, pulled 400 kilos and I pinched my sciatic nerve. My legs were numb for almost two months. I had to sleep on a chair because I couldn't lay down. And then from that, I still get numb legs all the time now. That'll never be okay unless they go in and surgically fuck with my back. And I don't want to do that. So it, I, I, I don't do it because I think like, like it's going to be catchy or people are going to like it. I do it and fucking absorb all the bullshit with it. What's funny is like, there was only like two or three people who lift that I actually respect as lifters who said anything about it. And only one of them said things to my face. The other two fucking talk shit online and then didn't say a fucking word to me. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I'm not worried about it. Most, most, and uh, all three of those guys are like in their mid thirties and have had surgeries already on their hips and yeah. back. But yeah. like, you're proving my fucking point, you know? There you go. Dude, uh, switching gears here. Um, Cause I'm a huge, I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan, dude. So I'm just very, very curious fan of you and fan of him. Like, how did that whole interview come about just out of curiosity? Did he reach out to you or did you link up with his people? How did that? Cause I know he only has people on that he's interested in. Right. Well, I've been sending him pictures of my dick for like months. Right. Oh, of course. That's, that's the <laughs> Everybody that makes who sense. Rogan just start sending them pictures of your dick or somebody else's dick, you know, whatever one looks better and just keep sending them. Nah, I um, <laughs> uh, I, I lived in LA for a while and, um, I, I was friends with a couple comedians and I used to hang out at the comedy store a lot. Um, I got to go up on stage a couple times and fuck around. And, um, I met him there briefly, like super brief. And, um, one of my good friends is one of his best friends. And like, we were walking past each other in the hallway and like, I, we kind of said, what's up real quick. And that was it. Right. And then on the next show, he talked about being at the comedy store and this giant strong man walks by him. And he's like, I just kept thinking this guy could rape me if he wanted to. <laughs> like I, I messaged him and I was like, you know, you're, you're lucky I wasn't horny or whatever, you know, just messed around. 
and I had uh, I had something. I had my TV show coming out, and I was like, you know, it'd be really cool to come out and promote the TV show. And he was just like, "Fuck yeah, come on, man!" And then that was it. Damn, dude. Yeah. Every UFC post fight interview, all the fighters always ask him, "Hey, when are you gonna let me come on a podcast?" Blah blah. blah. And you just <laughs> send him a DM. You make it seem so easy. <laughs> I guess the 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 intimidation or the the worry of being raped kind of got me yeah. in there. <laughs> he put, he knew he was gonna see you at the comedy store. Continuously, yeah. probably. I'd already moved by that point. It was years later. It's funny, but um, yeah, no, he was super cool about it. And um, I think what he likes, he doesn't. I, I'm speaking for him, and I don't know, but yeah, right. I. From paying attention to him, and I'm a huge fan of the show, it seems like what he likes is someone who's passionate about something, and then they have something that they actually want to talk about. Like, they, he doesn't want you to come on just to promote yourself. Like, that's, that's stupid, right? Like, you got shit to say. And he had a lot of stuff that he had been wanting to talk about. And so, like having a big man on, got that, got gave him the window, the space to talk about it too. Like the that vegan guy who was pretending to be the strongest man in the world, like wanted to talk about that shit, and it was a good opportunity for for him to talk about it with me. Right. So with that uh, type of publicity, in addition to you know next year going into your last uh, event, what do you plan on doing moving forward? Is are you trying to get into more acting films? Yeah, um, that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm filming a, a really, really cool show. Um, I got this gigantic part that I, I'm i so astounded that I have. Like, it's not... I didn't want to be, like, the, the big guy who stands in the corner and has, like, no lines or has one line and has to act stupid. And, like, I didn't want to be that guy. And like uh, Yeah, I... I <laughs> Um, <laughs> but um, I, I I really wanted an actual you know something I could sink my teeth into. As growing up, like that was one of my first loves. Like I used to write plays, and I I was a big fan of drama and stuff. And I used to be a big drama geek until I was in junior high, and my drama teacher made fun of me. And then I just went to that class, and then it just kind of dwindled when sports took over, you know. But that's always been my passion. And um, I really wanted to do it, but I wanted to do it on my terms. And I got this opportunity and it just, uh, it was like right there. It, it just like perfect fucking timing and everything. And then I, I just found out two days ago, I, I just booked another role for a giant movie coming out. And it's another big fucking role where like I have a ton of dialogue and all this stuff. And it, it, it's um it's looking like it's gonna be good but you know it's one of those things like you know you don't want to you don't want to put the cart before the horse or any of that but i'd I'd love to do that i'm 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 passionate about it and i enjoy it but i'm also opening up a youth center for kids where it's like like growing up i spent a lot of time at the ymca you know like we were very poor that was my escape and so I want something like that where kids can not be out getting in trouble. They're, they're either, you don't have to work out. Like we'll have like a, a playroom and a, and a study room and all that kind of stuff. And you can just come in and hang out. And I want it to be like just a cool place for kids to be. So that that's one of my other things that I'm looking to do. And, and I'm sure other stuff will fall in mind too. Yeah, man. It's a, uh, it's crazy how like you get one opportunity and then three more doors open and like you kind of tell yourself, well, don't want to jinx it. And then like you get so caught up in that, that years down the line, you look back and be like, damn, I'm totally progressed from where I used to be. And mm -hmm. I think, man, like moving away from strongman is, is probably like the right move, dude, because like I think nowadays with just the sport itself, I don't know, man. I don't know. When did when did strongman when did it originate? Was it the 80s or 90s? Uh, like the actual World sport. First one was in like seventy two or something like that. Oh damn. Okay. So I mean, we got guys that have been in it for decades, probably. But so with next year, when is the actual event next year? Like what time it's of the year? It's in May. So when do you start training for that? Is it like I'm do you have to start for prepping? It, training for it now. I I uh, come off an injury. I had like twenty something significant tears in my shoulder. 
and it was like hanging on a fucking string. And um, I had to let that heal up and everything. And I kind of was thinking like I would be done, but it healed up and it's feeling good. And I've been pushing it. And I've, I've already hit over 400 on overhead and everything. And I think the rest on my back has been really good. My deadlift is going really well. Everything's building up really nice. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like it's going to be a, a great show to walk away with. Like, I'll be able to come in, perform like I want to for the first time in years, and then walk away, you know? Like, that that's the fucking dream right there, you know? And I don't want to hold on to the sport longer than it wants me. And, um, you know, that's the danger of stuff like this is, is there's no – there's no clean breaking point. And then most right. people be forced out. Right. Yeah. You say 400 over your, over your head, dude, that's what I deadlifted this morning. <laughs> like I can't, I can't just imagine 400 pounds, dude. I was on the military press real quick. Uh, like a couple years or actually last year. And I was grabbing 225 from behind my head and my left shoulder just snapped out of place. I went to my doctor who um, is here in Orlando and he actually prescribed me this peptide. I'm sure you probably heard of it. BPC one, five, seven, Yep. Dude, I had full range of motion like in three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that you don't you work with like a, a hormone replacement uh, yep. clinic? I'm a part, a part owner of a hormone clinic called Mana, And uh, yeah, we, we do. We have like all the peptides. We have all the stuff not, like that's not shady and crazy. You know, right, we right, do, right. we take care of people. We do blood work. We're very, we're very smart and on point about it. And we actually gear a lot of our stuff towards women because they're kind of neglected in this area. And for us, we wanted to get a, a female physician to consult with and all that kind of stuff. We wanted to make it easy on people. So, yeah, we, we I'm really proud of the way that that works. I'm really proud of it. And it's also another thing like, like, like the same thing that how strong men are always saying that they want everyone else to, to, to do their best, even if they beat them. They also also a thing where we're all pretending to be natty, and it's like it's it's crazy. Like you know, th- there's there's no reason not to be honest. There's so many fucking people who pay attention and they take advice or they they look up to us and do different things, and they're like, you know, how come I can't do this or how come I'm not this? And I'm not saying that that'll do that for you, but it's it's silly for us not to just be real about it like we're in a day like it's it's not like it's illegal it's not like it's dirty or wrong it's like you know is as long as you're like when when you do certain shows you have to get tested and no for you can't you can't be all fucking high levels and crazy on that shit you can't but you know other than that there's there's no reason for you to like be worried about or hide from it you know it's it's really fucking good for you it's made me feel better it's made me feel younger you know like it's it's uh it, it's 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 something we gotta stop hiding from yeah and i think a lot more people are being open about it back when like instagram first started about 10 years ago 2010 2011 you had all these guys who were just paint this narrative of like especially in like bodybuilding industry chicken brown rice broccoli will get you shredded little did they know they're like on trembolone like 500 milligrams a week but it's like it's more and more open about it especially these bodybuilders more clinics are popping up um where they could just ship stuff straight to your door you get blood work done so it's a lot smarter especially with a lot of these guys that's what we do we we have like our our doctor meets with you online and it's like a zoom meeting and all that and but the other thing is is when people when people do eat chicken and brown rice for two years and don't see those results. And then they realize, oh, like, uh, this is this is the difference. Not, not, and, and like I'm saying, I'm being general, which is, is silly. Because for a lot of people watching this, that's not going to be the difference for them. The, a lot of people watching this, that is going to be the difference for them. But those people, when they find out that there is that difference, then they think that taking... 800 fucking milligrams of trend is just the same as taking 500 milligrams of test a week. And it's not, it's not the same fucking thing. It's, it's a completely different thing, which is why test is regulated and legal and trend is not. It's, it's uh, something we need to educate people on and people who are interested. It's super easy. I'm not trying to plug it. I wasn't even thinking about it, 
but Mana HTC, so it's M A N A H T C dot com. Then you can just take a test, like it's like ten questions and answers, and it's, it's it's super easy to figure out where you're at. And then you get your blood work done to make sure if you're cool. And it, we're not going to gear people into there's there's a lot of people out there who will illegally, well not illegally, they'll they'll tell you to take illegal things as if that's like normal and it won't affect you in any way and then they don't tell you to get your blood work and they don't tell you to take care of yourself and you end up all fuckered up you know it's it's it, it, there's a big line between clinically you know tested and and a doctor approved testosterone and all that shit some guy makes in a toilet it's very yeah. different <laughs> Yeah, man, I'll put the link in the description for you uh, for anybody who's interested. And uh, in addition to that, uh, you have some shirts available. Is that correct? I do. I I'm, I have a clothing line. I wasn't even, I mean, this is my clothing. I I, <laughs> I don't really worry about plugging stuff. I, I, I really just hope people can, like, learn whatever they're going to learn from it, you know? Like, like if someone's watching this and they're like, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to get jacked out on fucking trend or whatever, like, that that shit it'll eat your liver up and not only that like, test the word steroids is so fucking broad it's ridiculous the asthma inhalers are steroids right but the dangers that come with the things outside of like your normal health clinic stuff they're they're vast you know people tear it that people get hurt that roid rage thing, the only thing that causes roid rage that I've ever known is trend. Trend's the only thing that really gacks you out like that. Or if you're like trying to get lean and you take Winstraw, Winstraw fucking tears you. Like you, your muscles turn into sponges. So all of a sudden you get these weird tears and you get hurt in all these weird places that you just can't ever repair. And so a lot of that stuff, I, I think it's it's much safer and it's much better longevity wise and health wise and sexually like all that kind of stuff is so much better to just do it the right way like i don't even give a fuck if you do it through my clinic just do it the right way right 100 percent agree i think the issue with a lot of guys especially in bodybuilding is the guys just keep getting bigger and bigger every year at mr olympia and it's like in order for these guys to keep up they just got to increase it like i can i can bet you like the amount of shit that the dudes are taking at Mr. Olympia compared to like the eighties when Arnold and all those guys were taking it. It's probably like night and day when it comes to like dosages. I've and, seen, like, I've seen sheets. I've seen like breakdowns of certain guys stuff. It's, it's fucking like, it, it's like shocking. I've been in this game for over a decade. You know, I I've seen a lot of shit and to see what a what a, an average bodybuilder takes is fucking crazy. Bodybuilders are way more into that shit than strongmen. Most most strongmen aren't too crazy. I mean, yes, there are a lot of guys out there that do go crazy, and most of them it's like early in their career, right? They'll pop in, they'll do really good, and then they rip something apart, and then they're gone forever. And it's like like they, they can't walk right for the rest of their life after like one year of being decent. And it's like you, you didn't let your body develop. You didn't get used to it. Like there's so much that goes with it. And, and everybody wants that fucking fast track when the truth is, is like that fast track doesn't work. You might feel like it's working, but it, it is not. It is most certainly not. Yeah. Um, Mark, Lo Mark Lobliner, who I just had on, he, he always says this. He's like, if your body looks like shit before steroids, it's going to look like shit after steroids. you got to have that solid foundation of nutrition, training, all of that. There's no fast track. And I think a lot of young dudes, especially in the fitness industry, they take that, they get that misconstrued. I think it's just like a <coughs> magic pill. Um, but yeah, man, you got to lay the foundation first before even thinking about all that. But yeah. Well, listen, man, um, I appreciate you coming on. Like, trust me, when I say I appreciate it, I appreciate it. I know how busy you are. I'm I know sorry. I've been hounding you. You've been, you've been all over trying to get me and stuff. But I I want you to know that I wanted to do it or you wouldn't have never had my phone number. That's that I gave it to you because I wanted you to hound me to get me on. You know, so I was like, we're going to make it happen. But it, it's going to like just so everyone watching knows. 
we've set this up a couple times and I've had to flake out every time. Then we set it up for earlier. And then I had, I was in Darius Rucker's studio for eight hours today, fucking recording a song for the movie I'm doing. Like I actually get to sing in it and I play the fiddle and shit, but you know, like, like there's so much going on and you were so cool about it. You never once got eggy or nothing. And, and I knew the whole time that it was a cool thing to do. I like you and I like your style and shit you do. So I, I'm glad we finally figured it out and you fucking hounded me just enough to make it happen, you know, and I appreciate it. Let's go. It. Boom. Well, I appreciate that, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he is a man of his word because he ended up doing it. Uh, but listen, man, follow him on Instagram. Uh, thank you guys for watching this. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Rob, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. And I, uh, I wish you the best of luck in next year's competition. Thanks, brother.